everyone welcome to prostha hub i am myself dr jolsna and today we are going to discuss the topic diagnosis and treatment planning in implant dentistry so now it's exam time for many universities and i hope the final year pgs are preparing well for their exam so one thing you have to keep in mind is presentation of your answer is very important so as i always say include the content list and don't forget to write the references at the end of your answer and also highlight or underline the important points so that you can grab the attention of the examiner who is correcting your paper so for more details on how to prepare for the exam and how to study i have done a separate session on exam preparation i'll give the link in the description box so i wish all the best and also good luck and success for all the exam going pgs prepare well and do well in your exams so now getting into the topic diagnosis and treatment planning in implant dentistry let us see the content list the contents include introduction rationale for implants history recording extra oral and intra oral examination and also radiographic examination the bone assessment diagnostic cast and surgical templates the stress treatment theorem implant processes design treatment planning and methodology finally conclusion and references so this implant diagnosis and treatment planning is a very vast topic so i am discussing here on an exam point of view only the important headings that you need to include in your answer so before beginning i request everyone to please do like and share my videos if you are finding these videos useful if you are new to this channel prostha hub please do subscribe and support me if you have any queries topic suggestions or feedbacks you can either comment below this video or you can mail me at this mail id so let's start introduction proper diagnosis and treatment planning is the key to any successful treatment so we know the gpt definition of diagnosis that is it is a determination of the nature of a disease and treatment plan is defined as the sequence of procedures planned for the treatment of a patient after diagnosis so ideally the practitioner evaluates the diagnosis and then plans for the sequential treatment prior to any surgical consultation and what is the objective of this treatment planning it is to form an organized documentation of the patient's pre treatment conditions leading to treatment options in different phases so we have discussed about the different phases of the prosthodontic treatment in case of a full mouth rehabilitation that is it consists of three stages that is the pre prosthetic phase the prosthetic phase and the maintenance phase so once these treatment phases are determined then they are completed in a sequence which is compatible with the patient as well as the clinician's schedule and which is consistent with what it is clinically appropriate for the patient so a good rapport between the patient doctor a thorough comprehensive written evaluation and also a multi phase treatment planning certainly leads to successful surgical as well as prosthetic complex restorative cases coming to the rationale for implants so the goal of modern dentistry is to restore the patient to normal condor function comfort aesthetics speech and health whether we are restoring a single tooth or we are replacing several teeth so the clinical replacement of lost natural teeth by osseo integrated implants has become one of the most significant advances in restorative dentistry and this increased need and also advantages of these implant supported processes are as a result of many factors which can be divided into four categories they are preservation of tooth structure preservation of bone provision for an additional support and also resistance to disease so we know the advantages of implant supported processes like it maintains the bone and also restores the occlusal vertical dimension it improves aesthetics phonetics occlusion and also increases the prosthesis success and it reduces the size of the processes when compared to a removal partial danger like it eliminates the palatal area and flanges etc and it improves the stability and retention of removable processes thus there is more permanent replacement and thereby it improves the psychological health of the patient and improved health related to diet so these are the advantages of implant supported prosthesis is recording of history so this is designed to provide an accurate profile of how the patient's quality of life is being affected by tooth loss so it consists of mainly three elements 
that is the dental history the medical history and personal history so dental history includes identification of all current problems from the patient's perspective so it include the functional issues like unstable or loose denture inability to masticate efficiently when there is pain or tmj disorders difficulties with speech gagging and ulceration soreness of mucosa etc the medical history so a full and comprehensive review of a patient's medical history should be undertaken prior to implant treatment and this comprises of vital signs laboratory evaluation systemic diseases so vital signs include recording of the blood pressure temperature pulse respiratory rate etc and the laboratory evaluation where we evaluate the glycemic index the blood sugar level the total blood count and differential count the prothrombin time that is to avoid bleeding complication during surgery etc and then general as well as systemic conditions needs to be assessed so most of the conditions are relative contraindication and some of them turn out to be absolute contraindications for dental implants so some of the relative contraindications are active malignancies bleeding disorders cardiac complications infections like hiv radiotherapy etc and some of the absolute contra contraindications include age below 17 years that is the implant retards the bone growth of the surrounding area and so it should not be used especially in patients under an active growth period and smoking and radiation in leukemic patients etc based on the medical condition we can classify the patient as per the asa classifications that is the american society of anesthesiologists physical status classification so the asa classification groups the patients into five groups and uh, here the implant therapy can be uh, done for asa1 patients that is with no health problem and asa2 that is patients with minor health problem who respond well to treatment any patient whose health condition is in the category asa3 or higher should be carefully screened for relative contraindications or absolute contraindications usually the elective implant surgeries are not indicated for asa4 or 5 patient and in case of asa3 patient preparatory measures have to be taken before treatment the personal history where you can assess the oral hygiene as poor oral hygiene is a related contraindication for dental implants then tobacco usage again it affects the prognosis of implant therapy and it can lead to failure of implant because it directly affects healing and osseo integration and then para functional habits like bruxism clunging etc so patients with bruxism are again relative contraindications and these para functional habits induces immense load on the processes so all these should be assessed in personal history recording next coming to extra oral examination where we evaluate the facial symmetry skeletal profile facial contours tmj patient's speech and coordination lymph nodes etc so i'm not discussing in detail about this as we have already discussed this in our case history session coming to intra oral examination so intra oral examination is visual as well as palpation process so we have to assess the oral hygiene then intra oral soft tissue should be checked for any pathology and the arch form so mounted study models can assist in properly evaluating the arch form as well as the interarch relationship so the arch geometry impacts the position of dental implants that is in a v shaped arch it would be more easier to place implants with a greater ap spread ratio than a u shaped arch or an arch with straight anterior ridge then comes the residual ridge form where we assess the uh, ridge height ridge width the angle of ridge etc and then the tongue along with muscle attachments should be assessed and interarch space is again important because if there is an inadequate interarch space then a screw retained crown will become the preferred choice and if there is more than 4 mm interarch space then implants can be restored with cement retained crowns then existing occlusion and occlusal plane is evaluated so if the patient is having a canine guided occlusal scheme and we have to restore the canine then this occlusal scheme can be modified such that anterior guidance is shared between canines and incisors to reduce the force load 
Similarly, if the patient is having a group function, it is preferable to convert that group function to a canine guided occlusion in order to protect the posterior implants. Then comes the vertical dimension of occlusion. So, in case of uh, improvement of aesthetics or function or when there is a structural needs of dentition, we need to modify the vertical dimension of occlusion during implant treatment. And finally, the periodontal evaluation. So, periodontal charting and classification and documentation of the location of quantity of keratinized attached gingiva should be done. And also bone loss, that is vertical or horizontal defect should also be carefully ma mapped on this chart. So, these are the items under intraoral examination. Coming specifically to the clinical examination of the implant site. So, here we examine the length of the edentulous span which is especially important in partially edentulous conditions. So, generally we know that there should be 1.5 mm clearance between an implant and a neighboring tooth and a 3 mm gap between two implants. So, in order to place a 4 mm diameter implant, at least there should be 7 mm space. This is because there should be 1.5 mm clearance on both sides between implants and the neighboring teeth. Next comes the ridge characteristics. Uh, so, under this we assess the ridge height, ridge width, ridge angle and also quality of soft tissue on the ridge. So, uh, the soft tissue on the ridge that is the gingival biotype, the gingival zenith, the gingival line angle etc. is assessed and also the width of the keratinized mucosa can be evaluated with a balloon test or eye dentist. So, ideally the ridge should be covered with keratinized mucosa in order to have a good peri implant health. And if you want to know about the balloon test or eye dentist, test, you can comment below this video. So, careful palpation of the ridge can detect any presence of concavities and another procedure to determine the thickness or width of the alveolar bone is called as ridge mapping or bone mapping. For this we use bone calipers. So, here first the area that needs to be examined should be anesthetized and then the bone caliper tips. So, these bone caliper tips should be pierced through the soft tissue such that the tips hit the facial as well as the lingual cortical bone and then the reading is measured on the scale in this gauge. So, this procedure is repeated at various locations and all the measurements can be transferred to the cast. So, this gives an idea about the approximate ridge width as well as a rough estimation of the ridge contour. And this ensures that the diameter of the endosseous screw implant does not exceed the dimensions of available bone. Coming to the key vertical parameter in treatment planning for implant restoration that is the crown height space. So, this is defined as the distance from the occlusal plane to the crest of the alveolar ridge in case of posterior region and distance from incisal edge of the arch to the alveolar ridge in case of anterior region. So, this crown height space influences the type of prosthesis, the material choices and also the surgical technique that we need to follow. So, in order to provide sufficient room for the prosthetic components, adequate space should be present between edangelous ridge and opposing dentition. And ideally, for cement retained prosthesis, 8 to 12 mm crown height space is needed. And screw retained restoration generally require lesser CHS compared to the cement retained prosthesis because it can screw directly onto the implant body. So, this ideal measurement that is 8 mm, it consists of 2 mm of occlusal material space, 4 mm minimum abutment height for retention and 2 mm above the bone for biological width dimension. When the crown height space is greater than 15 mm, we say it is an excessive CHS. So, we know that crown height with a lateral load may act as a vertical cantilever called as the vertical offset and it is a magnifier of stress at the implant to bone interface. So, this can be corrected either by surgical methods to increase the bone height before implant placement or stress reduction method to the support system and prosthesis. So, uh, we can include uh, steps like shortening the cantilever length, minimizing offset load, increasing the number of implants or diameter of the implant and design implants to maximize the surface area. So, in these ways, we can reduce the stress in case of 
excessive ground height space. This is the inadequate CHS, which is less than 8 mm. So, an inadequate uh, crown height space may be due to skeletal discrepancies like deep bite or a reduced occlusal vertical dimension from attrition or abrasion, and also may be due to supra eruption of the opposing teeth. So, this can result in a shorter abutment, less area for cement retention, increased flexibility of metal and processes, compromised strength and aesthetics because of the reduced bulk of the restorative material, and also can result in poor hygiene conditions. So, we can do either osteoplasty before implant placement in order to increase the crown height space. And if the available space is inadequate due to over eruption of opposing teeth, depending upon the extent of available space, minimal enameloplasty, orthodontic intervention, elective endodontics, and uh, crown can be indicated in the opposing quadrant. Okay, radiographic examination. So, many imaging modalities have been reported to be useful for dental implant therapy, which includes IOPA, OPG, CT, CBCT, MRA, etc. So, all these radiographic examination is of utmost importance in implant dentistry as the bone in the proposed implant site is our primary concern. So, bone should be visualized in all possible dimension so that accurate data can be gathered and also jaw anatomy can be visualized before implant placement. And um, Post-operatively also, advanced imaging studies can show the failure of an endosseous implant to osseointegrate integrate or an improper placement of implant and violation of important structures. So, these radiographs are actually used to evaluate the width and height of available bone, density of the available bone, the surrounding vital structures and its relation to the implant site, any pathology in relation to the implant site and also for evaluating the remaining dentition. The use of radiographic sensor templates have become a mandatory diagnostic exercise for all implant cases. So, what is the need for this radiographic template? This is to correlate the position of the implant in relation to the available bone so that we can determine the ideal or the precise location of our implant, final tooth position, and the processes. So, many radiopaque materials have been used in fabricating these templates and they include barium sulfate, gutta percha, amalgam, lead foil, metal sleeves or beads, etc. And in some cases, these radiographic templates can be converted into surgical templates for use during implant placement. And usually, we make a conventional temporary partial denture and then the proposed implant positions are marked on the occlusal surface and then 2 millimeter hollow channels have to be created in these marked positions and these channels are filled with gutta percha and then assessing it radiographically. And many digital tools from many implant manufacturers have been developed which is used as an alternative to these radiographic templates. One such is the Simplant software from Materialize. So here they use the virtual teeth function for short edangular spans and single tooth replacement. So here the uh, clinician can design the replacement teeth via the computer program without the fabrication of a radiopaque template. Next, coming to bone assessment. So, after the radiographic evaluation, we have to analyze the quantity and quality of the available bone to determine the suitable site for implant placement. So, we have to assess the length, that is the mesodistal dimension, the width, the bacolingual dimension, and also the depth of the available bone, that is from the ridge crest to the nearest anatomical landmark. So, we can classify the bone as per the divisions of bone by Mish and Judy that is called as the ABCD classification where division A that is the abundant bone which is 5 millimeter wide and greater than 10 mm length where root form implants are usually indicated and division B that is barely sufficient bone that can be barely sufficient height or barely sufficient width. Then C that is a compromised bone either compromised in height or compromised in width. And finally, the D, the deficient bone, where you have to do augmentation procedures for implant placement. So, in this way, the quantity of the bone can be assessed. Next, the bone quality can be assessed by bone density classification. So, the bone is divided into five sections depending upon the type of bone. That is, D1 is dense cortical bone, D2 dense to porous cortical bone on the crest and coarse trabecular bone within, D3 
thin porous cortical bone under crest and fine trabecular bone within. D4 is completely fine trabecular bone and D5 it's immature or non-mineralized bone. So among these D2 bone is considered as one of the best implant beds. D1 that is a dense cortical bone can get overheated during placement and it's associated with failure. And uh, D2 and D3 bone has got the best load transfer. D5 bone it's not suitable for implant placement as it is immature and non-mineralized. And in D4 bone implant can be placed by packing the trabecular spaces with graft materials. And bone density is considered to be a key determinant in treatment planning, implant design, surgical approach, healing time and type of loading during prosthetic reconstruction. Next coming to the assessment of the available bone height or depth that is the distance from the crest of edangelus ridge to the anatomical landmarks. So ideally there should be an adequate safety margin of approximately 2 mm that is between the pikel end of implant and neurovascular structures and the anatomical structures to be considered before planning the implant length are in maxilla the floor of maxillary sinus and floor of nose in mandible mental foramen roof of inferior alveolar canal submandibular fossa and also the adjacent tooth roots. So these landmarks can be outlined directly on a periapical or a panoramic radiograph to clearly indicate the amount of available bone height. Coming to the phasing requirements or the implant positioning guidelines. So these guidelines should be used when selecting an implant site and also while evaluating the mesial distal space for implant placement. So as we have already said, the implant should be at least 1.5 mm away from the adjacent teeth. So there should be 1.5 mm gap here. And the implant should be at least 3 mm away from the adjacent implant. So 3 mm should be between two implants. And greater than 1 mm bone should be present on the facial and the lingual aspect of the implant. That means the implant should be placed in the center of the ridge so that there is adequate cortical bone both buccally and lingually. And this cortical bone prevents future hard and soft tissue recession. Here you can see that in order to restore an edangular space with the 2 4 millimeter implants, we need at least 14 mm of space. That is 1.5 between the implant and the natural teeth, 3 mm between the implants and the 4 diameter of each implant. So total of 14 mm space is needed. Now coming to the need for this spacing. So Allowing a 1.5 mm of crestal bone interproximally will allow for proper development of the healthy papilla. And also we can develop proper contacts and cone doors in the restoration. And it allows for an adequate width of soft tissue between implants and adjacent teeth. And also for the prosthetic components not to impact on each other. For the effective cleaning of the processes by the patient and to develop a harmonious occlusion. And finally to allow for at least 1 mm of space from the implant to the adjacent root. So this is the need for such implant positioning guidelines. Next, we are going to discuss diagnostic cast and surgical templates which we will be continuing in our next session. Thank you everyone for watching my video. If you have liked this video, please do like and share this. And also if you are new to this channel Prosto Hub, please do subscribe and support me. If you have any queries, topic suggestions or feedbacks, you can either come in below this video or you can mail me at this mail ID. So it's a bye from Prosto Hub until our next session.